Good morning, and welcome to D.L. St. Andrew's Parish Church this morning. The Lord says that where two or three are gathered in His name, there He is among them. And this morning in church, there literally are, well, there are four of us here in the building now. But there are far more of us that are watching online, and it's good to be God's people wherever we are this morning. And we know that the Lord is with us. I brought something this morning to show folk, and it's, it's a little Bible that um, I've inherited. It, it belonged to a guy called John Orr, and I don't know much about him other than that he was my grandmother's um, cousin. But John Orr was on active service, according to this Bible, and would receive this Bible, as many soldiers did in the Second War, from the king. The Bible has a little message from the king in it, the late king, and it says here, for centuries, the Bible has been a wholesome and strengthening influence in our national life. And it behoves us, that's a good word, in these momentous days to turn with renewed faith to that divine source of inspiration and comfort. So we come this morning, wherever we are, to God's Word, looking for inspiration and looking for comfort. It's interesting that the generation that went through that war are now in their 90s. We are spending a lot of time just now protecting those folk who are very vulnerable, who are older. But I wonder that we might actually give them a phone and ask them, what is it like to live through difficult times with faith and with that sense of being together? They have much to teach us. This Bible has not just the New Testament, but it has the Psalms. And I thought I'd start this morning by reading one of them. These words from Psalm 137. If you've got a Bible, you might want to pause this and find it and have a look at it yourself. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplar trees, we hung our harps, for our captives asked us for a song. Our tormentors demanded, so, demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while well, in a foreign land? Well, we are certainly going to sing God's songs here today in a new landscape, a foreign land, an area and a way that is different for all of us. But one of the things that the Bible does for us is give us a place to come with honesty as well as with faith. Those words were written as Israel had lost everything. Their city had been destroyed, all their hopes, their way of life was gone. They had been taken off into exile, and they sat by the rivers of Babylon and wept for all that they had lost. But there too, they had to work out how to sing God's songs in that new place, but to do it with honesty about all that was happening. So we look as we come together to what God has to say, and let's begin our worship by singing the words of what a friend we have in Jesus. If no one is with you, maybe you can sing out loud and not embarrass yourself too much. But let's sing and worship together.
thanks to Eric and to Rebecca for leading us in worship this morning. Shall we pray together? Lord, we are in this new situation and we cry out to you. We come with all our worries and our fears and our certainties. And we cry out to you. But this morning, Lord, we would remember that everything that we have, you gave us. At this time when we're so afraid that our way of life and everything that we have is fragile, we thank you that you gave it to us in the first place. Our friends, our family, our community, our food, our prosperity, our economy are all given from you because you are the one who gives us good things. You, Lord, are our Father. You created us. You knew us at the very beginning. And in Jesus Christ, you entered this world. You shared our lives in all their joys and, yes, in their sadnesses too. And so you understand we thank you that in Jesus the light comes, the light shines in the darkness, and it does not go out. And in these days of Lent, Lord, we look to Easter, to that promise that you've given us that everything will be well in you, for Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Nothing can defeat you. O oh Lord, where we are tempted to look to ourselves to be selfish, to hoard and grab close what we value, we ask for your forgiveness. And today, as your people, we ask your Holy Spirit would not just strengthen us, but would fill us with love for one another and for the world that you have given us. And so we come and we pray those familiar words of the Lord's Prayer. Pray along with me. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We're going to now read God's Word together. We've been going through some parts of Luke's Gospel, and this morning I'm going to slip slightly ahead, and we're going to read from chapter 11 of the Gospel of Luke. Luke 11, verses 1 to 13. And again, you might want to pause this if you're not listening to it um, live and um, follow in your own Bibles. Let us hear the Word of the Lord. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as, as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you've got a friend and, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves. A friend of mine has, on a journey has come and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside says, oh, do not bother me. The door is locked. My children are in bed and I, I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of your friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. 
Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you who are fathers, if your son asks you for a fish, will give him a snake? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Amen. And thanks be to God for His Word. We're now going to sing again the words of the song, Do Not Be Afraid. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord, as we come to your word this morning, we ask for your Holy Spirit, wherever we are, to touch our lives and our homes, that as we consider your word for us today, that you might speak to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. It might seem a bit bold to start by referencing a disaster film. But there is a scene that you may know in the movie Titanic right at the end as the boat is going down and all hope seems lost and people are running around panicking that the orchestra play Nearer My God to Thee. We didn't ask Eric to play that today, fortunately. Though I did see some supermarkets um, where some musicians had put on life belts and were playing it as people bought the last roll of toilet roll. That scene is romantic, but it's also pathetic. People doing something that is actually quite pointless. 
isn't going to make any difference whatsoever to what happens in the end. And sometimes that's how people look at prayer. It's a last resort. When you've tried everything else, when you can't do anything else, because prayer, after all, isn't very useful, or so you think. I wonder even today that there may be some folk listening to a religious podcast in the hope that something, because you've tried everything else to bring hope or to change things. When all the doctors and the scientists and the politicians and the self-appointed experts on Facebook have failed, then maybe we'll turn to the preacher and maybe we'll pray. Well, it's not going to surprise you this morning that I want to say that's not what we think as Christians at all, but rather something far, far more encouraging. Think about it for a minute. Here in this chapter are the disciples of Jesus. They've had a few chapters with Him. Now they've wandered around different places. They've seen amazing things. The power that He had to heal a paralyzed man, to raise a dead boy, to calm the waters of the sea, to tend the needs of the crowds, to feed 5,000 people. So much more. Practical things that changed lives forever, that brought hope. And then they said, teach us to pray. The only thing they ever asked for teaching on. And I find that really encouraging for, for a start for this very simple reason. They obviously found it difficult. I find it difficult. We all find it difficult. And that's quite reassuring. But secondly, here were these disciples, and they might have watched all that Jesus was doing and wondered how. How did he have this power? How did he change lives in this way? And then they saw it. You see, Followers of Jesus at that time were, were like students of a rabbi. And the students of a rabbi literally followed the rabbi around, not just listening to what he said, but watching everything that they might learn to do it as well, that they might learn to do what he did. So here were these students of the rabbi watching Jesus, that they might do what he did. And what did they see? We're told at the beginning of this chapter, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said, teach us to pray. They were watching Jesus pray. They were seeing that this made the difference. They were seeing how Jesus spoke to his father, that conversation that he had that began everything that was practical and was bringing hope and light into the world that day. And so they asked him, teach us to pray. You see, on the face of it, it might have seemed like a, a strange request. They might have said, teach us to preach. Or they might have said, teach us to heal. Or maybe they might have said, you know that, that thing you did with the loaves and the fishes, Jesus? Can you show us that? Or, you know, water, wine, that would be a good thing to learn. But no, what they said was this. We want to learn to pray like you pray. We want to have that relationship with our Father that you have. They traced everything back to that. Have you ever met a truly prayerful person? One of the things that you notice in purely prayerful people, is that they have a power in their lives that lets them cope with adversity. It allows them to be different. It allows them to calm and, and bring healing to others. In our crisis at the moment, as a nation, as a world, we need that. Oh, what peace we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And so Jesus teaches them the Lord's Prayer. It's slightly different versions in the different Gospels. Maybe Jesus taught it slightly different ways at different occasions. We learn it as Christians. We find it useful. In fact, we were told recently that we should use it as we wash our hands we learn it as if it was a ritual, a rite at times. But actually, if you look at the passage, it came out of a relationship. As Jesus spoke to his father. Father. 
That's what fascinated them. The way that Jesus spoke with his Father, and Jesus, in saying to them, call him Father, was saying, you can have this relationship too. Most people pray. In fact, a, a recent survey showed that 30% of atheists said that they sometimes prayed. And perhaps in these days, more people will be praying than ever. That's actually not surprising, because the Bible tells us that we're all made in the image of God. He's put eternity in our hearts. It is natural that we, we cry out even when we don't know what we're crying out to. But for Christians, it's different. Even in the Old Testament, as God's people had this covenant relationship with Him, they did not call Him Father. And yet that is the language that we learn from Jesus, to cry out, Abba. The Spirit does it in our hearts, that we cry out this relationship with God as Father, because in Christ we have been adopted into that family. We have had a new birth into this new family where we know our Father. It's interesting that when Paul writes to his congregations in, in the various letters, and you can find these in the Bible, he prays to Christians that are in really hard times, just like we are today, maybe even worse times. They're scared. They've been put in prison. Life is tough. It's hard. They're being misunderstood and misrepresented. And in his letters, he prays for his people. But he doesn't start by praying, oh, oh, may they be delivered from hard times. May they be delivered from persecution. May they have safety in everything that they do. May they not be hungry anymore. I'm sure he did pray those things, but that wasn't where he started. He didn't pray that they might have different circumstances to live in. Rather, in every single one of them, he prayed simply that they might grasp God's love for them. Here's how he prayed to the Ephesians. I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth has its name. I pray that out of His glorious riches, He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power, together with all God's people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Why did Paul pray like that? For this simple reason, because a relationship with the Father that lets you know His love is better than your circumstances being changed. The world says to us that inner peace comes from knowing that things are good round about me. I've got enough money in the bank. I've got enough food in the cupboard. I've got all the friends I need. I'm esteemed by everybody in society. Therefore, I can have peace and feel secure. Well, no, you can't, because as we've just found, all of that is fragile. Security comes by knowing that you are loved by God and that no matter what happens in your circumstances, He holds you. Our Father... Nothing in all creation, Paul will say, can take that from you. To the Romans, he says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, the present nor the future nor any powers, neither the height nor the depth nor anything in all creation will it be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, The other thing about having a relationship with Father is that when children talk to their parents, they can do so with honesty. You know, you don't come, if you're a child, and say to your father, none of my children ever did, O thou who doth provide for me and give me all that I need, didst beget me and didst conceive me in my mother's womb, grant me my lunch money. No, you don't pray like that when you come to your dad. You simply say, Dad, this is what I want. This is what I need. Even if it's selfish, you can come and have a conversation. 
That's what Jesus is getting at in the second part of this passage when he tells the story of the man who needs bread in the middle of the night and goes to his neighbor and knocks the door and his neighbor says, no, I'm not opening the door. Maybe understand that at the moment. So the man keeps hammering on the door until he is so annoying that the man gives him what he wants. And we look at this and we think, what does that tell us about prayer? Is that telling us that God's like a mean neighbor who doesn't want to give you what you want? That, is that what Jesus is saying? Well, I think Jesus is being honest and saying sometimes it might feel like that as we pray and we don't seem to get answers. But Jesus rather says that the man's prayer is answered because of his shameless audacity, because he dares to ask, because there is no prevarication, there is no politeness, there is no holding back with a holy form of words and etiquette. And for us, that means that we can be honest with God. And in our present crisis, we can pray. We can tell Him we're scared. We can tell Him we're angry and confused, even with Him. We can tell Him that we don't know what to do. We can go and rant against heaven, and God is big enough like a father to hear all our complaints. I started by reading Psalm 137, where God's people were absolutely desolate with what had happened, that they had lost, they felt everything, and they, by the rivers of Babylon, sat down and wept and couldn't work out how they were going to sing praise songs. Now, if you've looked up that chapter, and maybe you want to go and read it, you'll find the second part of it, and you'll wonder why the minister didn't read that, because the psalmist goes on to say, I want to smash the Babylonians' faces in and smash their babies against a rock. And you think, how can that be in the Bible? Well, that can be in the Bible because right then the psalmist was saying, that's exactly how I feel, and I'm going to tell God that. And because I have a relationship with God, then I can share with Him exactly how I feel. Folks, go and pray just now and just let it all out because your Father is big enough to hear your fears and your worries and, yes, your anger. But then the prayer goes on, doesn't it? Hallowed be your name. Kingdom come. The shameless audacity to tell God how you really feel and what you really want. And we might well come today and pray, Lord, give me back my normality. Give me back my Easter holidays. Give me back my job. Give me back my hope. Give me back all the things I thought I wanted to have. And God will hear that. But at the same time, there is that call to ask this question. What is God's kingdom? What does God want? What does our Father really want? We might not know all of that in the moment, but what we do know is this. God's will is for the poor. God's will is for the vulnerable, and God's will is for justice in our society. Your kingdom come, says a different version of the same prayer. Your will be done here on the earth as it is in heaven. Someone said to me the other day, words that I, I won't forget in a hurry, he, he said this, you will be asked at the end of this crisis, not did you keep your church open. You will be asked at the end of this crisis, not did you keep podcasting in, in new and creative ways through it, although we'll try to do that. You'll be asked simply this, when I needed a neighbor, were you there? We want to pray just now for those that are most vulnerable. One of the things I think is tremendously encouraging about how our society is handling these days is this, that we have turned our lives upside down. Many of us who are healthy, many of us who, if we caught this dreaded virus, would probably shrug it off. But we have turned our lives upside down because we are concerned for the most vulnerable. We are concerned for them and we want to keep them safe. And that is fantastic. I believe that is what God wants us to do. But here is the question that it raises for me and raises for many of us. Will we continue to do that when this is over? To care for the poor of the world, to turn our lives and our expectations and our 
desires and dreams upside down to care for them because that is the will of our Father. Then the prayer goes on in words that might sound very pertinent to us today. Give us today our daily bread. And we've just taken it for granted, haven't we? Up till now, we can go to Tesco and get it whenever we want, and suddenly we realize that we're dependent. The prayer gives us permission to pray for what we want. If you're worried about things just now, come and ask, as these people asked for their daily bread, so we can ask our Father for the things that we need. But that daily bread also takes us back to a story from the Exodus, where God's people had to depend completely on Him. They had no food in the cupboards. They had no supplies, and they had to rely that daily He would give them what they needed, the manna, one day at a time, one day at a time, appreciating His goodness every day. Maybe that's what we will need to do in our day, is learn to appreciate what we've got, learn to share it with an openness, learn to know that God has given us good things, and we might not have everything that we want, but our God is is good. Ask and you will receive. You might say to me, how does this apply today to say that God is good when this world is full of what we see as awful? Remember that these words were spoken to Galilean peasants who lived day to day. They were spoken to men that Jesus was inviting to come on the way to Jerusalem, on the way of the cross, on the Easter journey that would lead to death. Trust Him, they said. And here's the thing. Generation after generation of Christians who have lived through far worse times than we face today have found His promises to be true no matter what happened. I'm challenged also that we've said, have we not, so many times in the last few weeks that, or or sorry, few years that, "Ah, you know, church isn't about the buildings. Church isn't about the meetings or the structures or what we do. And suddenly we're left thinking, did we mean any of that when we said that church was ultimately about the love of God the gospel of Jesus Christ? What if for a while we don't have all the things that we thought church wasn't about anyway? Can we work out what it really means to live as children of our Father? The Bible is actually all about that in its honesty. The trials of Job who went through awful things in his own life. Israel lost everything and went into exile. And there we're asked the same question that slaves were asked in Egypt that people were asked in Babylon, that Christians have been asked in persecution, will you still trust me even if you don't have all the things that you once had? There's a rather obscure book in the Bible, which is the book of the prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk prays that God will restore the fortunes of Israel, but he ends the book by saying this, Even if the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine, even if the olive crop fails and the foods produce no food, even if there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior because the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me have the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights because He is there for me. The passage that we read from Luke's gospel in chapter 11 comes right after a lovely little story that some of you will know if you haven't or don't know it. Look at it at the end of Luke 10. It's a story of Jesus going into a home, the home of Martha and Mary. And there, Martha invites him in, and Martha does what many hostesses would do. She went into the back of the kitchen, and she began to prepare the food and bake the bread and get all the things ready for the meal Well, Mary just sat listening at his feet. Martha 
says the Bible, was distracted by all the things she had to do. And eventually she came and said to Jesus, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work all by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, the Lord answered, you're worried about many things, but a few things are needed. Only one. Mary has chosen what is better. Now, our sympathy might be with Martha. Martha is the activist. Martha is the doer. Martha is the busy person. Martha who responds to a crisis by doing everything that needs to do, all in the service of God. But what Mary has grasped at that moment is that the relationship is what is important. The relationship is the one thing that mustn't be taken away. Martha is distracted by many things, anxious and upset and worried It's interesting that she comes and says to Jesus, don't you care? She doubts God's care. You see, when our faith in God is based on what we do, what we can provide, what God gives us, and all the external things, then we always have that insecurity. Don't you care? Of course he cares. Martha, he made the bread that you're baking. He set the sun and the rain. He created everything in the beginning, and he's about to go to the cross for you. Of course, he cares for you. But Mary gets it, sitting at the feet of Jesus, not just gazing like some star-eyed fan, but actually sitting there meant something more. Because one of the things we know in the Bible is this, followers of a rabbi sat at his feet and learned from him. Mary isn't sitting in in, in a place of, of, of being a fan. She's sitting in a place of being a disciple. As Paul said, I sat at the face of Gamaliel. That's how I learned to be a Pharisee. Here is Mary learning to follow Jesus. Learning what he has to teach. It's interesting that what Jesus is doing is quite remarkable here because here is a woman who is learning. She is being a follower of the rabbi, just like Peter and James and John and the rest. What is he doing? Is he teaching her how to pray? In these days that are so difficult and we are afraid, we must pray. Not because it is the last act, the futile, desperate act of religion, but because it is the honest place where we come come before our Father and thank Him for all He has given us and cry out with all the pain and the fear that is inside. And as Christians know that we are loved, for this Father gave us everything, even His own Son, Jesus Christ. So let's do that together just now. Let us pray. Father, we come confused and afraid, some of us shut in and confined, some of us unwell, fearful for the vulnerable, and we seek your protection. We ask you today for the things that we need, the things that are just for us. We come with you with that desire for normality, that desire for this to end. But then we pray, praying for others, Lord. And this morning we would pray for teachers, for NHS staff, for those in care homes and those that keep shops open. We would thank you for their dedication. We'd ask that you'd keep them safe. We pray for business people. We pray for those that have lost jobs. And as we pray for them, Lord, we pray for the scientists, the medics, the government officials, the decision makers. Thank you for all the skills that you have given them. Grant them wisdom and success in all that they do. Oh Lord, we ask that you would give our nation peace. We ask that you would instill in us a spirit that would encourage us to love our neighbors, and respond. 
And yes, Lord, we come with an honesty and we ask, oh Lord, that you would end this chaos and its suffering. We come with all our questions of why this is happening and we do not have answers. But we look to Jesus Christ, the light that shines in our darkness, who taught us that you are our Father, who died that we might be adopted as your children, who rose again to say that the victory would always be in the end yours. We began our service saying the Lord's Prayer. Let's end by saying it again. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We're going to close by singing together, There is a Hope. Thank you to you for joining us tonight, or this, uh, this morning. There is a, an encouragement today um, that has come from the Church of Scotland and the Church of England, which is this evening at seven o'clock Sunday, you might put a candle in your window to light a candle to remind ourselves that the light does not go out and we will get through this together. Now know that you are loved and so love one another. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be yours 
this day and in all the days that come. Amen.